Okay. Um, well, welcome everyone to Gardens, a tool for cultivating community. My name is Joy Gary. Um, I am the founder of Efflores Culture and Design, which is a um, budding organization um, that's dedicated to redesigning land for um, uh, for uh, regenerative in regenerative manners, and um, uh, we will. Um, be going through this presentation and it will be me along with my colleague, um, Sharisa, and um, I'll have her introduce herself as well. Well, hello everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, my name is Sharisa Zapata Walker um, and I've worked with Joy in the past. I've known each other for a couple of years now. And currently I am the program manager at Mass Farm to School. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about that in the presentation, but. Uh, mostly be talking about some of the community uh, work. And so we're going to start with talking about how context matters. And so uh, before we start, um, it's important to know that every grower has a specific context that needs to be considered. Um, and so we intend to provide some resources to help you navigate what's best for you. We recognize that there are limitations with location, budget, and et cetera. Note that gardeners are innovators. Those limitations help to discover new possibilities. Um, and so we just wanna, uh, and we'll talk more about this later, but um, really talk about having a common vision within the community and why, what's the motivation behind what you're doing. Um, and not just for you, but um, for other members in the community to also have a voice um, in this collective vision. Okay. Um, yeah. um, and so some of the topics we're gonna cover is uh, exploring Boston's garden and urban farming history. We're gonna take a stock of the ways to utilize garden as a catalyst for community development and political and social economic change. And we're also gonna review the opportunities that exist in Boston to engage how we can move together in the next chapter. Um, so uh, in terms of the history of the Boston community gardening, um, Community gardening in Boston is inextricably linked to urban ag. Um, the, the foundations of, um, of how urban ag started was because of all of the community garden work and a lot of the gardeners were originally farmers. So starting in um, 1969, we see the Clark Cooper um, garden created in, um, in Mattapan and it was started with nine families. Uh, there was um, in the 1970, in 1970, the Nightingale Community Garden also was started with just a few few families who had um, a gardening history. Um, and in both of these, they just took over plots of land um, that was just not being used, and it was able to beautify the area, but also providing food um, for the community. So community activists, they just saw this opportunity to build soil and build community while feeding their families real food. Then in um, 1977, the Boston Natural Areas Network was founded and um, identified and preserved a lot of um, not just community garden lands, but all types of green spaces. And um, as we know, this, this, um, this organization is uh, um, now under the trustees of reservation, but they had strong roots in creating foundations for thinking about garden land management. Then in, in 1979, Mel King, who at the time was the director of um, the Urban League of Greater Boston and um, a state representative um, in the um, Ninth Sulphur District, uh, he proposed the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture's Preservation Restriction um, Act, which um, is currently still in, in um, working. And this act preserved farmland. What it did is it made um, um, the, the program just offers to pay farmland owners the difference between the fair market value and the agricultural value of their land. 
um, in exchange for the permanent deed restriction to protect that farmland for future use. So um, most of the land in Massachusetts, because of the amount of land being so small, there's um, high value on it. So it's it has this is one of the main um, acts that help to preserve land in, in Massachusetts. Um, some other examples of kind of, of things that were happening in the community was the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative was founded in 1984, just out of um, a lot of the land being, um, houses being burned, um, white flight taking place, and um, land being left in disrepair, and community members got together and was able to create a community land trust so that not only can agriculture happen when the land, but also how affordable housing and and um, community members having ownership over that. And that um, allowed for the projects like the, the food project to take place um, and similar projects like Revision Urban Farm, which was in the Dorchester area that is um, helping to house and home um, um, young mothers and then feed them um, food from the land. And all of that is basically this foundation for what we have today of this um, urban um, urban ag revival. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, but Article 89 allow, was established to allow, um, to make the, that more legal for um, us. Um, and so throughout the presentation, what we really wanna focus on is on really three points. So. Uh, we want to talk about community development, socioeconomic development, and political change. Um, and with that, um, and like I had mentioned earlier before, uh, you really want to think about how do we define community? Is it your family? Is it your neighbors? Is it a city, a town? Is it where you grew up? Um, is it a, you know, a value that you have? Um, so really defining what community means to you as you move forward and doing this community work and having discussions with people um, so that you can come together and, like I said earlier, have some collective values around what that means. And when we talk about community development, uh, we really are looking at, um, so you can go to the next slide, yeah, um, just different ways that we create uh, gathering spaces. Um, and so we can really think about once we have like our vision and kind of, you know, what's bringing us together and why we're doing the work, it's going to guide the development process. Um, so really thinking about what are the community needs, you know, thinking about food sovereignty, especially in urban areas, growing stuff that um, can nurture us um, by doing plant medicines and having flowers um, and then regenerating the local ecology. So thinking about um, pollinator habitats um, and stormwater management, just to mention some of the things. Um, additionally, so for socioeconomic change, like a major part of that change is, um, is restoring local economies and increasing the ability for black and brown communities to create generational wealth. And property and small business ownership are two of the main ways um, that can be done. So community farming and urban farms and community gardens can provide um, an open door for economic opportunity. So through community land trust is one way that you can do that where it preserves the land for um, um, extended periods of time or in per, um, perpetuity um, so that it can be used for um, community use, whether it is gardening or farming or it is for housing or some other um, community use. Um, so one of the, um, the pros of that is that you can have a nonprofit organization that manages the land, manages um, the finances for that, but the one of the, um, the um, uh, the cons of it is that um, because it is a nonprofit organization, there are um, there can be um, difficulty of managing um, both the resources that are needing to function, both the organization and the land, and managing the um, the the staffing and um, making sure that you have the, the proper expertise for um, for that foundation. Uh, another way for socio socioeconomic change is um, just building green businesses. So on, on farms and gardens, you can have a farm, um, whether it's an individual person running the farm or a team and having a co-op farm or having a community-wide farm. Uh, there's also just 
uh, food development. So whether you're making value added products out of things from um, local farmers like sauces and, and stews and um, ready-made meals or starting a food truck or a, um, a small uh, restaurant could be other options. Um, plant and medicine can be used to um, create um, either cosmeceutical lines or um, cosmetics that are, are good for, um, that are also good for medicine or just making um, uh, uh, tinctures and um, uh, teas and different things that can be medicinal for, for people to uh, instill a sense of health. And um, another way of supporting the local economy is supporting the local trades um, people. So uh, th those who are plumbers or um, landscape architects can help with the, the development of the site and allow um, for, for, for keeping that economy um, just in your neighborhood. Um, it's also a green, gardens are green spaces and they can provide um, uh, opportunities for uh, for you connecting to the land in the middle of the city, in the middle of a concrete jungle. There are mo and multiple studies that talk about or that um, that are proving that mental health, uh, the connection between mental health and being in a green space, and so having it in the, um, having one in the city can can help to um, just improve general mental health. And there's opportunities for education. So having schools and, um, and neighbors who are teachers come in, inviting them into the space to be able to utilize that space for, um, for educational opportunities. And finally, their safety. Um, Communities that have gardens and urban farms um, have a lower instance of violence in and around that area because the community, when they feel like they have a sense of ownership over that plot, then they they act as a protection for the plot and, um, and for the area around it. Um, and so then the third thing is political change. So policy changes can be driven by gardeners and farmers in Boston, um, land use um, and um, zoning laws were changed back in um, 20, 2013. Um, the example is Article 89. Um, if you're curious as to what Article 89 is, it is the rezoning of property to be an urban agricultural site. So the difference between gardening and agriculture is basically that you are making money from the food that you're growing. And the USDA defines it, I think about $1,000 a year. And so this now allows for people to legally make money from, the, from their plot of land. Um, the, it also um, governs the types of farmings that can be done. There are some restrictions around it. Um, there can only be, um, in terms of animals, there can only be honeybees and chickens, and there are very hard restrictions around those and keeping those. You do have to get a variance in order to allow for that farming, um, the, um, cultivating those types of animals in your area. And then this, um, and then it also just uh, has restrictions around farm stands and the sizing of the plot and what you can do. And that just opened a door for just farm and garden development. And because the city saw that there was so much um, interest in it that they um, decided to start uh, mapping out where are all of the plots of land in the city of Boston that uh, that can be used for green space and um, in open space and for gardens. And so there is now a department of green space and open space development. They do provide funding for community groups and nonprofit organizations to be able to take on and develop a piece of land. And then statewide, there is the Community Preservation Act, which um, allows for the development of, um, of gardens um, and parks and open spaces that are gonna be used by the public. Um, some other things that have been happening is there's just been a focus on food security, especially since um, what, what's, what's been happening with COVID-19. We see the Boston Food Access Council was established um, in late 
um, 2019 and um, the goal of the group is to make sure that food access is available for all in um, the Boston area and they are um, delving into matters around urban ag um, as well as with SNAP benefits and other um, resources to get food to people and making sure that they're food secure. Um, I do encourage everyone here that if you are a Boston resident to join on um, to some of those meetings to make, make sure your voice is heard. Um, but there's also on a Massachusetts scale, the Massachusetts um, Food Systems Collaborative has a white paper full of different um, policies that are currently underway and I'm going to try to put it in the chat so that you can see um, some of the things that are happening with regards to land access. There is a, um, an act for farmers of color to have increased access of land. This is happening both in Massachusetts and on a national scale. scale. So if you're interested in supporting that, um, you can make your voice known by contacting your local representatives um, and supporting that. And finally, the um, under food security, the our um, um, city councilor has put out a um, a food justice agenda for Boston that details a number of points to look at um, the food access council and the Boston. Um, um, Office of Food Access have both been working on some of the points in that agenda. I'll put the, the link to that also in the chat so that you can um, look at the details more. But the, the final political change that can happen is um, in the education sphere, making it, um, uh, making policies around school gardens so that there are more, there is more funding around it, but there's also um, policies happening um, around farm to school. So the organization farm, Massachusetts Farm to School has been both finding funding and strategizing how to get farm fresh food to students in schools of all ages. And um, there's also most of their work is around um, lunch food sourcing, breakfast food sourcing and, and doing that in a cohesive manner. So next we are going to talk about um, the pathways that we can take uh, to activate some of these different platforms. And so uh, one of the key things that we kind of want to talk about is to grow in the community you want to build. So um, I think there's many times that we might have opportunities to either grow in different areas just because a plot opened up or um, you might know someone there, but really cultivating the community that you live in um, and really building kind of the neighborhood that you're building um, to just really uh, make it grow in that way and use your energy in that matter. Um, the Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> the next um, thing is making sure that you organize. So when you do have, when you have chosen what community that you're going to be in, um, organize with all of the people, create a collective vision and mission around what you wanna do. Um, if you're already in a community garden, um, have conversations with your neighbors in the community garden and organize together and say, hey, how can we work together to, to build our capacity? And then after doing that, create a plan. You're gonna need a plan for governance. How are, how are decisions gonna be made? Um, are we gonna do um, just kind of a collective um, way of making decisions or is there just gonna be one point person? Um, then you wanna think about production. As you're growing vegetables, are you gonna be growing them just for yourselves and your families or do you wanna um, to grow for the community? And so that requires some planning around that. Um, how are you going to distribute? Who are you distributing to? Is it going to be for to the, the community? Do you have the vehicles or the, the funding to be able to do that? And then thinking about your budget, what does it take to, to, um, to grow the amount of food that you're needing? And, um, and what does it take in terms of the inf infrastructure? Make a plan about what you want and then make a plan about how much money do you all collectively have and try to get um, to bridge those gaps by um, uh, talking to other community gardeners or building and building a capacity by bringing your funds together or um, 
or uh, getting grants for your garden, your community garden space. And then finally, you wanna make sure that you have um, a good sense of what the work plan is, is going to be like, who's gonna be doing the harvesting and the planting and um, the, the weeding throughout the season and watering, all of those things need um, people who are gonna be governing that and paying close attention to that. And then, um, and whether or not it's gonna be individual plots or is it gonna be a collective work? Um, so, and then after you're doing that, you have now a collective, a collective force and a collective voice. So utilize that collective voice in whatever way you think is going to make sense for that community that you're in. Sorry. Next, what we really wanted to talk about is the value of the gathering space as a meeting space. And so a lot of times we just see some of these spaces kind of just as a growing space, but um, whether you have an official kind of infrastructure in place or not, it's really a great um, place to make it a hub to invite neighbors um, to have dinners at to talk about other community initiatives that are happening and you can invite different organization and partners to that. Um, and now with COVID uh, regulations and restrictions and not really knowing how this is going to like play out in the next couple of months, really thinking about ways where uh, we can meet, uh, you know, on the web or making meeting spaces mobile um, and how to keep in contact with people in person and virtually. So really thinking about all those challenges um, and really being flexible in that because even after COVID, there might be people that can't come you know, to your meeting for a number of reasons, um, whether physical restriction or time restrictions or whatnot. And so really um, making those meeting spaces as open and as inclusive as you possibly can. Um, you want to add value to the space or to the community by utilizing that space for the community. So maintaining the property is going to be key, um, keeping it clean and beautiful, uh, making sure that um, you are cleaning up when there's trash blowing into your space. We know that you're not the one putting it there, but it's helpful for the community to see something beautiful and, and then also um, when your neighbors are having some of the same issues, helping them out um, with, the, with their plots of land. Um, in the winter, when there's snow, making sure that you're removing that snow, one for safety, um, the other for beauty. And then it's an, also an opportunity to hire youth crews. And again, keeping the, the, um, the economic opportunities within the community. So seeing where there's um, young people trying to have some entrepreneurial spirit, support them in that and find ways to, um, to, to fund that. Uh, lead community projects, leading beautifying um, projects like the um, Love Your Block um, pro uh, grant project will help you add value to the garden and um, connect to the neighborhood. So it, um, the Love Your Buck grant program provides, I think, up to $5,000 to community groups, whether they're ad hoc groups or um, a nonprofit organization. And, um, and it requires that you are connected with the community and it allows you to, um, to uh, revitalize the area, whether it's with art or with plantings, um, different trees, or um, just cleaning up graffiti. Um, it's, it's just a very great way to be able to, um, to beautify the area and show love to the area. Um, educate. So whether you're an educator or there's educators in the garden, invite the educators to utilize the space. So there's science, science classes that are around you in, in the schools around you, um, allow fitness instructors or other instructors to utilize that space for education. And then, um, and then supply, making sure that you can, so if you can supply um, food to the community, do so, um, whether it is um, something that they're gonna have to pay for or um, or it's going to be subsidized in the funding, or if you're going to do donations, find ways to be able to, um, to pr provide food and medicine. Um, it could be as simple as having a potluck from the, from the things that you're, you're growing, um, or it can be as um, complex as trying to do some sort of CSA share on a, on a monthly basis. So um, think about all of the ways that you can connect um, and add value. And then finally, you wanna engage, have 
conversations with multiple types of people in the communities, not just the neighbors, but the local businesses um, can be an opportunity for you to um, to sell some of your produce at the local bodegas or the corner stores. Um, the local community organizations partnering with some of the initiatives that they're having could help with just um, being able to have staffing or someone who might be interested in, in helping you weed the garden for an afternoon. Um, attend the civic association meeting so you have a, a sense of what's happening in the neighborhood during the hours that you're not there. And then it also um, utilize your voice to support some of the initiatives that they are doing there. And then finally, make policymakers aware of what, what's going on in, in, that, um, in the community garden, in the neighborhood, and all of the connections that you're making um, so that one, they're aware of um, some of the good things that are going on in their neighborhood and that they can support that. And um, I think collectively engaging all of these different types of groups um, creates a community and then also creates um, a hub around that garden. And I think that was um, mostly all um, that we had to share. So I do want to open up the floor to take some questions. I'm going to so stop sharing this for a moment. I don't know if there were any questions in the chat. It seems like there weren't any questions in the chat. Okay, and so if there were specific questions, if you wanna throw them in the chat or if you wanted to raise your hand, um, uh, then we can have you unmute yourself and you can ask. So there's one question here. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk more about governance of a new group. The Mama's Initiative is starting up a garden group to support people growing food. Yeah, um, I don't offhand have um, uh, a manual for that, but I'm pretty sure that like if you can Google um, guard, community garden governance or community garden manuals, there are some uh, around uh, about how to um, gather people and what are some things to take into consideration? I don't know, um, Sharissa, if you had any specific resources or Michelle, if Michelle's still on. I, I guess the, the stickier part of this question is that in Medford and Somerville, there's a lot of inequity and racial issues which are slightly different than Boston, but related. Um, and so we're specifically trying to uh, start a group in a in a way that um, that has some of our values built in, um, and so we're working with like translators to translate some of the materials that that we're um, that we're starting up. But like, I I just I'm wondering if there's a specific like group that you can suggest uh, as a model or or whatnot to, with a specific lens of um, trying to address inequities in the cities. Inequities with gardening in the city. Um, offhand, I can't think of a, or a, a gardening organization that's doing that, but there are, there are some resources that are with some farming organizations. So um, the Northeast um, Farmers of Color Land Trust is, um, is being run by, um, trying to remember the name of the farm. So uh, I, I think part of uh, NOFA Vermont is connected with them. And if uh, you can contact NOFA Vermont, they will direct you. Yeah, and I'll 
also just put it in the chat for you to um, check them out. But I think that they have some resources that would be um, really um, helpful. The, also the, um, the Northeast, um, or excuse me, the National Young Farmers Coalition has a, um, a manual on racial equity with regards oh. to food justice specifically. And so I think that those could probably be two resources, but let me see if I can pull them oh. up quickly. Joy, do you have connections to, uh, or contacts for Leah Penman? Not at the moment, but Leah Penman's farm is the one that runs, um, runs the, um, the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. I just wanted to uh, comment that there was a workshop on Saturday about fostering diversity and inclusion, which is what I think you're talking about. And I think those workshops are being recorded, right? So you might be able to go back and, and listen to that workshop. I think it's a real challenge figuring out how to reach out to um, people who are um, have different languages and different resources. So um, I yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, thank you for that. Also, I think I guess one thing to be said is that going where people already are on some level where where people are already gathering, and I know that we're in COVID, but there are community groups that are um, um, culturally specific and reaching out to them um, as a mechanism um, will be really great. And, and I will say that in general, there is some level of door-to-door -door, um, in-person contact that's gonna have to happen in order for you to be able to, to really reach the level of equity and, um, that is needed because many communities of color are, um, they go by word of mouth um, and um, just have oral traditions. And so there's going to have to be some element of building relationships with people of the communities that you are wanting to, to invite into the garden space and allowing them to have leadership and ownership over the, the, um, the, the, the community outreach. I don't know, Sharice, if you had something else to add to that. No, I agree with everything. Um, the, another resource, if you want to contact is New England Grassroots Environmental Fund. They uh, fund community gardens throughout um, New England, including the Somali community gardens up in Maine, community gardens in Worcester uh, and down in Providence. So they have a, a wide network of connections. Thank you. So um, there was another similar question. Are there published models for this type of thing? Um, a, a question from Jay, can you give examples of how to engage students at school gardens during summer months? Yeah. Can I answer the first question, Joy? Yeah, um, there are some other models. I'm not sure in terms of um, like if there's published material, but um, the Sweetwater Foundation in Chicago, Illinois is a really good example of that. Um, I uh, will put their information in the chat, but they have been doing um, much more than community garden. They've been, been revitalizing their neighborhood on a massive scale, um, providing opportunities for, for work. Um, for youth and for um, adults to be able to teach youth um, various skills from gardening and farming to entrepreneurship and, um, and uh, architecture, architectural design in, in some of the um, um, uh, woodworking trades. And so that's a really great example of how to like get people involved in, um, uh, in, 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 in activating the community. Um, and with regards to, yeah, I think that's that. What was the, the second question? If you could repeat the second question. 
Yeah, those examples on how to engage students at school gardens. I was gonna say with the Sweetwater Foundation, we were gonna show a video, but we weren't sure if it's gonna have enough bandwidth to um, for everyone to see it. So we suggest like you definitely go on YouTube and check them out. They do amazing work. Um, as far as engaging students in school gardens during the summer. So I work for an organization, Mass uh, Farm to School, and we have a ton of um, resources for curriculums through the school year and in the summer months. So I would suggest go to massfarmtoschool.org and there's like uh, resources publicly available. Um, I'll put my email, my work email address. So you can also reach out to me. Also, Vermont um, Farm to School has also a ton of resources on their website that they just publish a ton of curriculum um, and resources that you can have. So I would definitely check out those uh, sites and I'll put my email in there. So if you guys want to reach out personally, you can uh, reach me. Can I add something to that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so my high, the high school in my town um, partnered with the farmer's market in our town and the, the farmer's market allowed the high school students to bring the produce they grew to the market uh, to sell at the market. So they had that experience too. Yeah, and Vidya also mentioned how the City Sprouts is also a great connection for community gardens um, in that vein. I think also, the, I would say the Food Project has done some similar work where they they have a um, they have a, a school garden um, program where they're teaching young people about um, gardening, and then in the summer um, they're hiring young people and teaching them more about farming um, and anti-racism work. I don't know, were there any other questions? And actually I will say that the food project does have a, um, an institute that they run, their winter, winter institute that they run throughout the winter um, that goes into detail about how to engage youth um, across uh, uh, culture, different cultural backgrounds on a farm and utilize that as a mechanism for being able to build community. Yeah, so we're just throwing some more of the resources that were mentioned in the chat. Um, and as there was previously mentioned, the grassroots fund, they do fund um, ad hoc organizations. So you don't have to be an, um, a nonprofit organization in order to get funding for starting a community um, gardening project or um, for one that's already up and running. And if it, okay. Oh, can I ask you a question, Joy? Um, so you mentioned Sweetwater. Um, mm -hmm. th that model uh, was a model that worked in a neighborhood where you, it, it went all the way to the bottom. It's, there was, it, they cleared buildings that were uh, condemned and they were able to start from scratch. Are there models that are um, in, in communities that are further along? Uh, models where the communities already have something in, in, in you're starting um, from there. There's um, a community that um, I think he he was a pastor from Maryland and he was one of the keynote speakers at the Gardner's Gathering two years ago, two, three years ago. Um, and so that was a really cool model where they kind of build a community of, I'm sorry if I'm messing this up, but they build a, a model between churches, I believe, 
-hmm. and there was different community gardens within the churches and the, and the reason they did that was because that was uh, uh sorry i was just reading um they were less likely to take the land away so because it was on church ground so that was really cool that they built a network and then they built a network i think with uh places like north carolina and other farms out there um and throughout like other black uh churches throughout the south so i know that is something also uh that was great to think about sorry i didn't mean to cut you off troy oh no i didn't have anything to um to add there um Yes. Yeah. Um, Reverend Herbert Brown Jr. and the Black Church Food Security Network um, is an example of that. Um, I think there was another, was there another question? Um, okay. Susan, would you? Oh yeah, I think Fred is just putting in some of the, the end of workshop links. Okay, uh, awesome. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Feel free um, to uh, reach out to us if you're having um, further questions. There were, actually was a question about the white paper, so I can um, get the link to that out to you as well. Um, and... that's all that I have. Thank you so much to both of you. That was really great. I was listening. I know I was muted, but <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Thanks. And thanks to everybody for sharing all those different resources. That was really helpful too. Um, uh, I can put all this stuff from the chat. So all of you are going to get, everyone who registered will get, and so make sure you look in your junk tomorrow because that's probably where it's going to go, um, a link to all of the recordings of the workshops and um, any resources that were shared during them. So I'll, you know, a lot of links were shared in this chat. And if you didn't get all of them, don't worry, I will um, make sure that they get into that folder too, so that you can all take a look later. Um, well, it looks like it's still nice out. If you're not, I mean, you should definitely join us for the next workshop session. <laughs> if you're not, enjoy the evening. And um, thank you all so much. Take thank care. you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Happy spring. Mm -hmm.